Good morning. We are so glad you're here with us today. Amen. How many of you are ready when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord? Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm excited to be at church today. We're going to speak some life today. I am the righteousness of God. I stand in covenant with him. And through this, I have new life, new anointing, and new power. I will not worry, nor have fear. Lord, your word and your spirit, they comfort me. I am increasing in your knowledge and in your wisdom. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body through your covenant. I am healthy. I am blessed. There is nothing missing and nothing broken. You have made me a blessing, and everything I touch is blessed. Lord, I thank you that my family walks in obedience to your word and to your will. Take me, Lord. Take Ridgeville Church of God to the highest place in glory. Amen. Let's worship the Lord today. Amen. Lord, we just thank you, God. We worship you today, Lord. We thank you we can come together and worship you in Jesus' name. Wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul. This bag of bones. I try with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a vagabond. And just when I ran out of road, I met a man I didn't know. Told me that I was not alone. You picked me up, you turned me around, and placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior, because He healed my heart, He changed my name, forever free. I'm not the same. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior. choice but to believe my doubts are burning like ashes in the wind so so long to my old friends burden and bitterness you can just keep them moving you ain't welcome here from now till I Walk the streets of gold I'll sing of how you save my soul This wayward son has found his way back home You picked me up, you turned me around You placed my feet on solid ground I thank the master, I thank the savior Savior, 
was far too wide but from the far side of the chasm you had me in your sight so you made a way across the great divide left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside and there at the cross you paid the debt i owe broke my chains freed my soul and for the first time i had hope thank you jesus for the blood applied thank you jesus it has washed me white Jesus, you have saved my life and brought me from the darkness into glorious light. And you took my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again. And now death has no sting, and life has no end. For I have been transformed by the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me wide. the 
darkness into glorious light. saved me that one last call I don't know if you've ever been called one more time but thank you Jesus he had mercy amen thank you Lord
for from you are all things and to you are all things you deserve the glory you are Father, we thank you for all the things that you've done for us, for your hand of protection that's been over our life. Lord, we're thankful for that, and we give you glory for the provisions that we have, for the roof over our head, the shoes on our feet, the food in our refrigerators and pantries. God, we're a blessed generation. But God, would we at some point just put all of our material things aside and just get lost in your presence. And just to give you the glory, night and day, day and night, Lord, could we just get lost in your presence. In the wicked generation and world we live in, we need you now more than ever, more than ever. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to James customary here to read scripture before our tithes and offering and while you're turning let me just help you a little bit as you know today is our home for children service and this scripture right here tells us that we have an obligation now South Carolina is blessed at our state campground we have three homes full of children that have come from all different walks of life. Some so significantly disturbing that you wouldn't even bother to say it from a pulpit. But we, as the church of God, has put a place, a refuge for them to go to. Why is that so important? Well, listen, it's important because we want to embed the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is why we do VBS, which is right around the corner. You better sign up and you better come. It's why we got a bake sale next Sunday. Why? Because our children matter. This past week, the Church of God of South Carolina, for the first time in two years, held a campground or camp meeting with 200 and something, six to nine year olds. 48. Of those 200 and something gave their heart to the Lord for the very first time. In addition to that, we had 23 that said, I have been sanctified. You know that is the second beyond salvation, right? Beyond that, we had 12 children that received the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in an unknown tongue. Six to nine. Come on, somebody. God is good. Amen. Amen. We had 29 recommit their heart to the Lord and eight said, I'm called to the ministry. Why is it important? Because some of those children attend the very homes that they direct. And you may say, well, pastor, I don't have a whole lot. If you got a dollar, God will bless you. See, the beauty of the home for children is you can participate in what's called the 120 club. That's saying, pastor, I will pledge $10 a month to help those children. 36 children. And not only that, but we have a transitional home to help young ladies. It's not for the men. Men, you're on your own. I'm just kidding. But it's to help some of those ladies that once you reach the age that we can no longer tend to you, we still want to pour into you and help you transition into the real world. And so what you're going to give today, if it's not earmarked, 100% goes to the Home for Children home. But if you say, hey, pastor, I want to take part of the, the 120, you can go to the booth and you can say, can I sign up? You can put $120 in your and put it on the and mark it. You can even be, there's a 240 club for those of you that says, I want to be a double blessing. 
$20 a month. I look at it now, Bishop Kearns, and I'm like, you know, that's, that's really only three Dr. Peppers, three cases of Dr. Peppers now. I'm, inflation needs to come back down. That's five gallons of gas to make a lifelong impact in the children. You'll never know. You may never know their name, and that's fine. Because if we're in this to make a name for ourselves, we're in it for the wrong reason. I want to be able to make heaven my home and have children come and knock and say, hey, because of you and because of the church, I had food for the very first time. I felt loved for the very first time. I didn't have to worry about nightfall coming and being attacked in a way that no child should ever be attacked. I didn't have to have reoccurring nightmares of dad or mom coming in drunk about to beat me. You know the story. You hear it all out in the public, but we're blessed because we get to support here in South Carolina. And so I'm just asking you, would you, and you knew this day was coming, I hope you prayerfully considered to give. The Bible says here in James 1 and 27, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit the orphans and the widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. We're the lifeline to this. You make an impact. And at any point you decide, I'm going to go to Malden, Bishop Kearns, and Sister Kim will open up the doors and walk you through the homes and show you the facilities. And you may say today, Pastor, I don't, I don't have, all I got is tithe money. Guess what? Your tithe money helps support the home for children. So little is much when God is in it, but if you'll remain faithful and consistently give in your tithes or even in a special offering like this, you're going to make an impact. So if you'll hold your tithes and offering in your hand, I want to pray, Father, right now, you're worthy of it all. All I have is yours. I am blessed and I'm where I am today because of you. And there have been moments that I wondered if I even would be able to have a next meal but my life has not been in turmoil as these children have. And I ask you right now, God, that as we take up this special offering for these children, that longevity in the kingdom is where they'll be. That they'll get to a place that they'll honor you and grow up and go to our youth camps and go to church Sunday after Sunday. Some have never made it to church prior to coming into our care. We don't take it lightly what you have commissioned for us to take care of. So God, today we do our part. Beyond prayer, we give to make a difference. So would you honor that this day? In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Would you come before the house of God and bless in this offering? The South Carolina Church of God Home for Children has been caring for little ones, the least of these, since 1956. Our mission is to offer a safe and secure home for those who do not have a family or who cannot safely stay with their biological families. Each child is nurtured and cared for, but most importantly, they are shown the love of Jesus in a Christian home. Like never before, our mission is needed today. Every year in South Carolina, nearly 4,000 children need the care of a loving foster home. These include girls, boys, teens, babies, 
children of all ages. As a licensed child placement agency, the Home for Children works to meet the needs of those who cannot speak or care for themselves. Whenever you did for one of the least of these, you did for me. Our foster parents, staff, and leadership team work diligently to provide a safe haven for children in need. The faithful prayers and support of individuals, churches, businesses, and organizations make this work possible. The ongoing ministry of Our Home for Children has made an eternal difference in the lives of thousands of young people. And with God's grace and provision, we will continue to serve all those whom He entrusts to us for years to come. However, this ministry does not continue without you. When you give to the Home for Children, you are giving hugs, you are giving meals, you are giving help, you are giving love, and you are giving hope. The true hope that only comes through Jesus Christ. Thank you so much. Tim and I have just basically come today just to say thank you and pastor you did a fantastic job with uh, the promo about the ministry and so we will be in the front as you exit this morning we have some brochures with information about the ministry we'd love to share with you and if you're already supporting the ministry stop by and get a gift from us and even if you are thinking about doing it get a gift from us just something to say thank you because your church is so good to this ministry and Tim and I and we realized this ministry could not move and be effective without the support of our local churches so thank you for all that you do and we are celebrating 66 years of ministry this year can you give the Lord up that's amazing but this song just says then and there how many remember the day that Jesus saved you and, and what we try to do at the Church of God Home for Children is to offer hope of a better life so that these kids can have that then and there like we do. Every road I walked had led to nowhere.
you thankful there's more Amen. than this life? That's right. I'm sure it's not very often you get to play the intro for your husband to come to the podium. Not anymore. <laughs> after many years of ministry, serving the Lord, Bishop, come. This couple has been an impactful part in my family's life. And to see you transition from pastoral 20 plus years to care for children and do a phenomenal job. It's not a high praise job. And I might get in trouble for this, but he can't take my license, so I'm okay. You're not in the political game because you're across the street, often overlooked even by your own peers. But your heart has never stopped. You've raised a daughter that is serving the Lord, little children coming up care about the next generation. Today it is my greatest honor to hand you over our podium to minister to my people. Wow. Now let's give him praise. He deserves all the praise. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Pastor, you are so kind. And we're both humbled to be back with Pastor Houston and Sister Houston and uh, Isaac and little Izzy, who's now growing up. We looked back the other day and we saw a picture of my wife holding Izzy when she was just on the uh the bottle still and so we go back quite a ways with this beautiful couple i honor them and I honor we honor each and every one of you here at the ridgeville church of god thank you so much and would you give god praise for his goodness to us and i mean that sincerely god is so good to us well somebody help me god is good and all the time god is good your pastor has been very gracious to us. Yes, we have been uh, in pastoral ministry for nearly uh, 35 years and now here seven. So we have transitioned and we are honored to be in this position, this role. You're absolutely correct, Bishop. Um, this is not a political position. You do it like you do, you and your lovely wife. And like each and every one of you do, you do what you work for, for the kingdom of God. That's the ultimate reason all of us are here. That's why we're here. That's why we do what we do. So thank you again. And we honor you on your pursuit and accomplishments of your, uh, your graduate work, earning your Ph.D. And you did that to better serve your congregation. So we honor you, Pastor. And uh, this couple has been the same since we got to know them quite a few years ago. I'm old enough to be their parents. That's scary on my end. Now, I married a younger woman intentionally. I thought when I get old, she'll take care of me. But she's already found some really nice nursing homes around Greenville, and she said, if you don't behave, that's where I'm going. So I'm trying to stay in shape, and I'm trying to watch what I say and what I don't say, but um, God's been so good. And we're honored to, once again, this is actually the fifth time, I believe, we've been at Ridgeville, and I've got every message that I preached here in my portfolio. Uh, twice the Holy Spirit moved, and I did not preach, but I've got another subject that I'm going to attempt to talk about this morning for the next few moments. Would you stand with us, please? In the book of Matthew, chapter 6, I'm going to read, and we'll read together, the Lord's Prayer, and I'm going to take a little different approach and just focus on one thought, and that is one of the most difficult things that we've ever done, and I don't want to stay there because I want to be a blessing to you, but it's a choice that we all make that'll mean the difference between success and failure. 
between victory and defeat, between joy and sadness. And it's a simple word, forgiveness. One of the most toughest, most difficult things we have to deal with is forgiving others and then even ourselves. And I'm just going to talk about this for a few moments this morning. We'll not keep you real long because as your good pastor said, we'll be there in the foyer to say thank you for your support of the children's home. And by the way, pastor, yes, we had a lot of kids. I don't know if you... Of course, we didn't differentiate. We don't spotlight them. We got a lot of kids there in our camps this week. We got others coming. But thank you for what you do for the ministry. We actually work for you. That's a fact. Someone said, who do you work for? I said, well, we have administration we serve. We have our inner office staff and the house parents. But we really work for the local church. Because of you, we're able to do what we do. So thank you. So drop by and let us say thank you for all that you continue to do to bless this ministry. Now, in the book of Matthew, a former tax collector, he makes this statement. Jesus was, was teaching his disciples to pray. In Christ's time, gurus or teachers, they always taught their disciples a certain type of a prayer. And so the 12 disciples felt left out and they were saying, Lord Jesus, teach us to pray. And this is what he said. In this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Father, thank you for this privilege again. We do love this family, but we also dearly love this beautiful congregation. Many we've got to know down through the years that we've been privileged to be here and we thank you God for what you've done here at Ridgeville but we thank you for what you're doing right now and we thank you for what you're yet to do in the days weeks months years to come should Jesus Christ tarry we thank you for what you're about to do and God we just praise you because we're here today this is the day the Lord has made and I will rejoice and be glad in it and everybody said, amen, and tell that person beside you that they're looking good this morning. Would you do that? Honey, you're looking good this morning. You look good every morning. Hallelujah. That's pretty smart after 40 years, isn't it? And it's the truth. So I'm very, very blessed. I like the casual day. I think you have this opportunity maybe once a month or so, Pastor, and, and so I get to uh, leave the necktie behind, as the old song says, going to leave it all behind. I got to leave the necktie behind this morning, so I like the opportunity to be a little bit more, a little bit more comfortable. But um, I'm going to share for just a few moments on this thought of the, of the power of forgiveness, a little different approach to the Lord's Prayer. At first, it might seem like a, a little bit of a mundane subject. I mean, so what's so big and what's so difficult about forgiveness and, uh, you know, if you've lived long enough in life, you and I will both agree that we've all got to deal with life's issues, ups and downs, good times and bad times and happy times and sad times, times when we have plenty, times when we have little, times when we're healthy, times when we're not so healthy. As a matter of fact, last week we were taking the Home for Children, actually two weeks ago, the Home for Children display out of the tabernacle after a camp meeting, and something grabbed a hold of my side, and I got down on all four in the parking lot, and I thought, oh no, another kidney stone. Has anybody ever had a kidney stone? That's the kind of stone you don't want, and I couldn't breathe. And my wife said, what's wrong with you? And I said, honey, I don't know, but I can't breathe, and I realize what I experienced about three years ago, I was experiencing again. And so ended up in the emergency room over the weekend, not this past weekend, but a week ago. And 
Uh, sure enough, that's what I was going through. So whether you're healthy and happy or whether you're not so healthy and you're dealing with issues, regardless, we all have to deal with circumstances in life. So let's just for a moment focus on this prayer and then we're going to zero in maybe for a few moments on a very key significant portion of the scripture that Jesus reemphasizes at the end of this prayer. Now, I've got some sermons, Pastor, that really I enjoy preaching that's actually sort of a pleasure to preach because they're memorized and, and they're a part of me. And then every time God allows me to preach that again, and maybe once a month or, or once every year or once every two years, I add some, uh, or God adds some fresh material to it. And it's just part of what I enjoy doing. I love talking about the second coming of Jesus. I, I love co- talking about the healing virtue that, that Christ extended to the woman with the issue of blood. I, I love to talk about the miracles of the Lord, how he fed the 5,000 on one occasion not counting the women and children, and then the the 6,000 on another occasion. I love talking about all those miracles that Jesus did. I I love talking about and and thinking about how Jesus Christ walked on the water, and only one disciple said, if that's you, Lord, bid me to come. And sure enough, you know who it is. It was Simon Peter, and the Lord said, come. And he was walking on that water, and then he saw the circumstances around him began to sink like we do when we see the circumstances of life. But Jesus reached down and picked him up and brought him back safely to the boat. I love talking about the miracles of God, but really, and in fact, we all have the potential to release the miracle working power of God by implementing this fundamental factor, key issue, and ingredient in this prayer. Now, probably everybody can quote the Lord's Prayer in this room. You could categorize the Lord's Prayer perhaps in about five different ways, but basically the Lord's Prayer is comprised of petitions and praises. Basically, you could sum it up in those two words. Our Father, which art in heaven. I'm quoting from the King James because I'm dating myself. I usually carry a new King James with me. I've got every version on my bookshelves, but I learned so much in the King James is sort of embedded in me. So again, our Father, which Art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, that's praise. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You're petitioning the Lord to bring his will down here on earth as it is in heaven. Your pastor was talking about our culture. Our culture needs deliverance, and so we're praying, oh God, please hear our petition. Let your will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. And then here comes another petition. Give us this day our daily bread. How many knows that a good uh, baked loaf of bread out of the oven, or even if you go to the local grocery store and get Wonder Bread or whatever your favorite is with some butter on it. When you're eating your delicious lunch, you you sort of like that staple food, the, the bread, which in Jewish culture... Bread was the staple food. As a matter of fact, they didn't have the silverware that we're accustomed to. And so they they broke the bread off from the loaf as they sat down, typically on the floor, sometimes leaning over on their elbows and ate. And they took the bread and they sopped their food and they ate the bread with their food together consistently not like we eat today we're taught to separate our food we're taught to eat with our fork we're taught manners and I like that but in actuality bread was the staple food and they used it to gather their food and to eat it and so therefore in the Lord's prayer the Lord said give us this day he's teaching his disciples that it's okay to to let the Lord know that we are dependent. God knows what we need, but what the Lord's really saying is we need to remind ourselves that we know, Lord, we're dependent upon you for our daily bread. Does anybody feel that way in this house today? Oh, I thank God for his daily provisions. And then he continues, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debts. Dead oars, then lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. But comprised and in that prayer, you'll see praises 
and petitions. But let's focus for just a moment on verse number 12. Forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. Maybe maybe this is for me more than anybody else in this room. I, I don't know, but, but I found out that I am learning that in order to walk in victory and in order for me to enjoy the blessings of God, there are some things I've just got to let go of. You know, when you're born, you're born into this world innocently, and the first thing that happens to you is you are spanked by the doctor. Has anybody? recalled that you don't remember it but you know that's the fact and they get you breathing all you've done was you came into this world and immediately you're dealing with trials and temptations when you grow up you're met with words like this no stop don't don't you dare and now we're reciprocating the words that our parents showed us and told us and mandated to us that we had to abide by. But our entire life is an experience of growing and learning and dealing with circumstances. But in these circumstances of life and what we deal with causes us at times To be offended, and many times, not intentionally, sometimes it's unintentional, we have to learn that we have to let go of certain things in life. Now, let's just focus on forgiveness for just a moment, if you would allow me. At the end of the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus comes back to the thought in verse number 12, and he makes this statement as if he is summarizing what is the most important thing that we need to do. Help me here. This is something I've never preached. I've never taken this approach with the Lord's Prayer, but it's just something that's that's on my heart and on my mind, and maybe, maybe it'll bless somebody today. Is this live stream today, Pastor? Is it live? Maybe someone watching, it'll it'll bless you today. But, But we have been offended by others. It may be a family member. It may be a friend. It may be a foreigner and I have met people that bitterness has kept them from becoming better and they have stayed where they were years ago because of an offense or because of something that has happened and God just dealt with me and said you need to let some things go speaking of me maybe there's someone else that needs to let some things go so that you can go forward because before he brings you out he's got to clean us out if we're going to be carried out so God sometimes has to do a work in our lives even if we've been saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost and I believe I am and I know I am but he's still working on me like the little song says he's still working on me to make me what he wants me to be so at the end of the Lord's Prayer Jesus comes back and he's emphasizing what is important in verse 14 and 15. And this is what he said. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you. Now that's strong That's strong language right there. God is not just telling us that we have an option. He's actually mandating that we must forgive others if we ourselves are going to be forgiven. Let me just read that again. That's I'm I'm preaching to myself today because in life, in circumstances, in ministry, in the public forum, no one is exempt from dealing with situations where we have to let things go wars are caused because people don't forgive other people marriages are broken up because it's hard to forgive what's been done when one spouse offends or hurts another friendships are broken because we don't forget and let go kids get in fights brothers and sisters the list goes on as a matter of fact sometimes I have to forgive myself does anybody know what 
I'm talking about today. So for just a few moments, let me move forward. There's three types of forgiveness I want to talk about. Not just the horizontal, but the vertical. And I want to address that first because Jesus said, as you forgive others, he will forgive us. The greatest miracle that's ever taken place is when Jesus Christ forgives you of your sins. If you're online watching today and you've never asked Jesus Christ to forgive you, you need to say, Lord, forgive me of what I have made out of my life, which is a mess. As a matter of fact, you don't even have to try to make a mess. We're born in a mess. We're born in sin and in iniquity. And what we need and what the world needs more than ever before is an old-fashioned revival of repentance and forgiveness. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. And that's point number one. If you've never been forgiven or if you have been forgiven and down through life's journey, you begin to accumulate burdens and frustrations and issues before you know it, we're burdened down and we forget the joy that comes from serving Jesus Christ. But can you remember when you first accepted Jesus? Do you remember when you asked him into your heart? If you do, would you lift your hands this morning? Do you remember you felt light? Do you remember the bird song sounded sweeter? Do you remember the people sounded like they were actually kinder? Life was different. The air was more crisp. The sun was bright. The blue skies were lovely. Life changed because the Lord rolled our burdens away and he who the Son sets free is free indeed. The greatest gift is when Jesus Christ rolls our sins away and we're a new creature in Christ. Behold all things are passed away. Behold all things become new. Jesus Christ was, he is, and he will forever be the greatest gift that mankind ever could possibly receive if you believe that would you say amen <laughs> forgiveness you know the hardest thing we have to deal with in life and maybe this is the heartbeat of this simple message is to say I'm sorry Because nobody's ever wrong. It wasn't me, bless God. It must have been him. It wasn't him. It must have been me. You probably didn't watch anything like I watched down through the years because... This is sort of elementary, but I like television programs where I don't have to worry about people being indecent, and I don't like people cussing at me and partying because I don't like that in my home. So we revert to programs like Family Matters where, where Urkel is the main theme. Anyone know what I'm talking about? I, I, think, I think I hit a nerve. See, Urkel had a problem. I'm like Urkel in a lot of ways. I got problems. Urkel was highly intelligent, but extremely uncoordinated. Wherever he went, there was a catastrophe, and he loved to go to Laura Winslow's house and spend time with Laura, and if Laura wasn't there, he spent time with Carl, Laura's dad. And inevitably, Urkel did something to perturb and upset Carl. And Carl did what most of us do a lot of the times. We get aggravated. Say the word with me. Aggravated. I don't know how many syllables there are in the word aggravated, but in the South there's about 15. Aggravated. Steve would trip over a coffee table and break an expensive vase that the family had as an heirloom. And Carl would go, Steve, Steve. His eyes start twitching. And Carl and Eric would go, now Carl, now Carl, don't get mad, don't get mad. And Carl would say, Steve, I don't have to take this. Get out of here. Go home, go home, go home. Before I know it, Carl is mad. Steve is hurt. 
Before you know it, we're mad and we've hurt somebody else. And then we got to come back like Carl did a hundred times and say, Urkel, uh, I'm, 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 s- say it with me. I'm sorry. We're done. A hundred percent said, I think the word sorry. God's been good to my wife and I. We've been very blessed in our ministry still are I'm not done I was honored to receive a hundred percent unanimous support from my board that went to the state council pastor and the state council I'm surprised I thought surely somebody may want to you know remove me and not that anybody has said it but naturally they wouldn't say it but I got a unanimous support from the state council of South Carolina so each department goes through this at uh, the summertime before the general assembly on an even year so I've got two more years to serve if I don't blow it And after that, maybe two more. I don't know. But my wife wants me to work as long as I can. Because when I'm working, I'm staying out of trouble. And out of her way. Can someone say amen or oh me? Huh? Huh? I got some amens here, women. It would be a great time to shout right there. And I know people have told me that they want this position. I don't blame them. It's an honor. But there's no such thing as autopilot, as a lead pastor, or in my position. It's work. It would be easy to live out the Carl Winslow and Steve Urkel scenario in all of our lives. And if the truth be said, we all have. The difference between making it and breaking it, and it's not easy. It's not easy for me. It's not easy for you. But this is where we live. I don't like what's taking place in D.C. I am very thankful that the Supreme Court overturned Way versus Road 49 years later. Now it falls into the hands of the courts of the local state. I've read that 50% of the states will make it illegal and 50% will continue to allow it. But I don't like a lot of the things that we're seeing. I don't like inflation. I don't like the fact that just less than a year and a half ago I could fill my tank for X amount of money and now it costs me this much money to fill my tank. There's a lot of things I don't like in life. But those aren't the things that's going to make or break me. Where I live is I've got to learn to deal with God, myself, and others. There's your choice. And your biggest battle is not with God. It's the man that you're looking at in the mirror. Or the woman. So vertically, before we can begin this journey and recite and live and put into practice and assimilate this prayer, we must be forgiven. You sang about, Sister Betsy, the blood on one of your many songs. And by the way, your praise team of musicians They do an awesome job. Would you let them know that you appreciate them? Awesome music. Your sound tech, your media, awesome. You're very blessed. We don't need to, as some people would say, forgive God because God doesn't make a mistake. We have to acknowledge, though, at some point in time that as the heavens are high above the earth, so are God's ways higher than our ways. So we come to our senses and realize, no, we don't need to forgive God because God can't sin and he doesn't sin. He's not a man that he can be tempted. But we have to come to the realization that what God does is perfect. We don't understand it now. We're going to understand it by and by better down as we continue through this journey. But I now see through a glass dark. Then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as also I am known. So we got this, we got to get this forgiveness thing started correctly from the get-go. And that doesn't mean it's a one-time stop at the altar. Man, I'm feeling God right here. It reminds us of our oldest grandson. He had gotten saved not many days before he mentioned this to Nina. He said, Nina, when I was younger, 
I used to why a what, meaning lie. He said, now that I'm older, I just why a widow. In other words, he's not as much of a liar as he used to be. He's getting better and lying less. And he was dead serious. And if you don't think your kids lie, wake up and smell the coffee. It's called the Adamic nature. We were pastoring where Trey and Andrew Brown are now at Calvary, and God was blessing mightily. And my wife, I don't know why she did it. She tempts us this way. She put out chocolate candy bars, sort of like, sort of like the Houstons gave us. We had a nice, nice welcome goodie basket. We got there, and it had almond joys and mound bars. Well, mounds are dark chocolate, and the doctors tell me that dark chocolate is good for my heart, so I can't eat one mounds bar. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? It's good for your heart. There's my justification, brother. Smoke is good for my heart. So I ate to my heart's content. Till my stomach said, that's enough. So before the meal, my wife says, come here. Andrea, as a little four-year-old, had got into the candy bars. And there was chocolate all over her lips. And... Of course, her mother didn't want to discipline. She wanted me to because she's real sweet, and she wants me to do the dirty work. She said, talk to your daughter. I said, why, why don't you? She said, I think you need to. It's a good time for a life lesson. I said, baby, didn't mommy tell you not to eat the chocolate before we eat, even though she shouldn't have put it out there and tempted you? Didn't she tell you that? He said, she said, uh-huh, uh-huh. And, and I said, so why did you do it? She said, I didn't. I didn't. I said, Angie, you want to rethink this? I said, there's chocolate on your face. She said, I don't know how it got there, but I didn't eat it. And you can't spank them. You got to walk away and realize when I was a child, I thought I was a child. But when I became adults, I, an adult, I put it with childish things. I didn't spank, but I did say, Andrew, I said, the evidence is right there. You have incriminated yourself. You ate the chocolate bar. She vehemently denied it, and even to this day, I do believe she denied it, but the evidence was there. We all have to go back to the cross. It's not a one-time fix-all deal. Does that make sense? I do say, Lord, I don't understand. I do say, Lord, these people, it's driving me crazy. No one's ever thought that, right? Your boss or the people that work for you. No one's ever thought that. You don't have to raise your hand and incriminate yourself. You may even say that about your own family members. That's why some of you don't like to go to family reunions. But get it right vertically. And from there, we begin this journey of implementing this Lord's Prayer. It's actually the disciples' prayer because the Lord taught them to pray real, real quick. Vertically, the Lord forgives. He forgives us. If we confess our sin, and someone may be watching this morning, you say, is it that simple? Yes, it is. It is. Don't wait till you try to get it together. You'll never have it all together. Confess your sin, 1 John 1, 9. He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all sin, all sin. I was a bad, all sin. I did this, all sin. I'm horrible, all sin and iniquity. He is faithful and just. That's the most powerful message that the world needs to hear. Vertically, he forgives. And the Lord said in this prayer, as our Father has forgiven us, so we must forgive others. Here's three categories. Family, friends, and foreigners. I'm not going to keep you long on this. I know my time's probably gone. Let's start with family. Won't even touch friends. Won't even touch the foreigner. But our own families. Your rise and fall based on your forgiving and letting go of your family members. I'm feeling something here. 
I get a call the other day. My wife calls me and said, honey, are you going to be mad? I said, I don't know. I said, no, I'm not going to be mad. She said, I backed your forerunner into the garage door. I said, so? It's not the first time you've done it. I didn't get mad, did I? We have two separate garage doors. She hit the remote, opened the garage door where our golf cart is. She thought that the garage door was open where my Toyota was, and she just backed into the door and just pushed it out. She said, you're going to fix it? I said, I'm going to straighten it. I'm going to hit it with my knee and my foot. I'm going to straighten it, but I'm not going to get a new one because it's most likely going to happen again. Where she pulls into the garage, I got a hole in the sheetrock. I got a storage room. I got the garage, and I got sheetrock and a storage room, and she got a little too close. She just put a hole in the sheetrock. You're going to fix it? No, because it might happen again. But really, it doesn't matter, and, and the Toyota wasn't that tore up. I'd say, don't feel bad because I saved all these years. We've been married over 40 years. Don't feel bad for me that she put a big nick in the back of my forerunner. I'm over it, I think. That's a simple example. But that's where we live. Just because we were hanging curtains the other day in the house, and I was satisfied with the first set that we hung, but she wanted to try another set she'd ordered. And then she wanted to try a third set that she'd ordered. I said, honey, I said, I am wore out holding these curtains up. I said, I, she said, which one you like? I said, I really don't care. I said, I just like the curtains. Which one? It doesn't matter. And she's going to send some back. It's a gift. She buys it. She checks it out. She's going to send some back. And I'm being facetious, but yet I'm telling you the truth. How could I possibly get mad at that beautiful young lady that has committed to me in ministry all through these years? You could think of a hundred things that you and your family members have got upset about. I am obsessive and compulsive. Some call it a disorder. I call it order. God's a God of order. I like things done a certain way. She's neat, but I'm fanatical. I drive her crazy. You might say, you're that way. I said, I sure am. Who's that way, Sister, jo- Sister Betsy? Anyone like things really neat to the point you're obsessive? I drive the poor woman crazy. She loves me. I love her. But once the vertical is straightened out, and I know this is a little lighthearted, but I'm dry- someone's going to receive this. But then the horizontal act of forgiveness with family first, then with your friends, and then even with the foreigner. Man, I have pulled up to the McDonald's drive-thru, and I have pulled up, and I got to the one speaker before that person did, and the lady comes on to McDonald's and speaks to this person before they speak to me, and they got in front of me. And don't you know that's very irritating when you're on a time schedule? I got more amens there than I did anything else, Pastor. That's the foreigner. You see, we deal with the family. We got to live with the family. We got to live with each other. And in the body of Christ, when is it ever going to be perfect when that which is perfect is come? Jesus. Until then, you're my brother. You're my sister. I'm your brother. She's your sister. Glory to God. I'm preaching now. The Lord's Prayer. Oh, it's easy. Praise God. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's coming. I'm looking forward to it. Give us this day our daily bread. And while you're at it, put a steak in there and a T-bone and lobster and, and crab legs. Give it to me, Lord. I'm blessed and highly favored. And there's nothing wrong with, with going to Captain Benjamin's and enjoying a buffet down at Myrtle Beach. But then we get to the next part. Mm, forgive us of our debts. Yeah, Lord, do that as I forgive our debtors. Are you serious? Do you know what they've done to me? I'll forgive them, but bless God, I'll never forget it. I'm not going to let anything anybody has done intentionally or unintentionally to me hinder me from going forward. Sometime he's got to clean me out before he can lead me out. 
Joseph could have stayed in that pit when his brothers sold him into, when his brothers threw him there, when the nomads took him off to, to the foreign land. He could have stayed in prison. And Potiphar's wife falsely accused him. He didn't understand it. He was done wrong. If you've lived one second, you've been done wrong. We're going to be done wrong. I was done wrong two weeks ago. I was done wrong. I told God about it and he said, get over it. Don't let what they did bring you down. Let me clean you out so I can take you out. Oh, the Lord's prayer is replete with praises and petitions. Deliver me from evil, the Greek, the evil one. Yours are the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. But don't bring up that forgiveness stuff, Lord, because you don't know what it's like. Wrong. Let your musicians come back. I need to quit this thing. I'm going too long. I, I know I have, and I, I want to be able to come back sometime in the not too distant future, maybe the next decade of Jesus tarries. But I feel the Holy Ghost. Does anyone know what I, the vertical's easy? You won't have trouble with God. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? But you're going, God, are you sure that no good? knucklehead is part of the family of God and you expect me to love them and forgive them and to treat them decently Simon had a little problem with this go forward about 12 chapters chapter 18 Simon said Lord you got some idiots out there and they're driving me crazy my God, I feel the Holy Ghost. I'm just now beginning to preach. It took me all this time to get here. How many times do I have to forgive those no good rascals? Seven times. See, seven is a sign of completion. Seven days. He worked six. Seven, he rested. It's, it's a number of significance of completions. Perfectiveness. Lord, and Simon said, I'll sew this up. When they hit the eighth time, bless God, I'm going to let them have it. Like I've done some other people down there. His hands were calloused. <laughs> he fished with a net. He could, he could take someone out with his. I'm getting fed up with these Pharisees and Sadducees. These newcomers, these Jews, they're driving me crazy. These Gentiles don't know their head from a hole in the ground. Does it sound like us today? You know why? Because there's nothing different about the human race. Here's the miracle. Lord, do I got to forgive him mm, seven times? You know what he said. I did some research. You know, what did he say? Someone tell me. For $100, what did he say? Yeah, talk to the pastor. He's got the money. I don't have it. Just kidding. How many times? 70 times 7, which is what? 490. Do you think he meant that 70 was the limit, or was he trying to speak metaphorically? What he was saying was, and I read commentary on this, you can't put a number, you can't put a limit on the grace that God's given you and me. So why are you putting a limit on the grace you extend to your brother or sister? My God, I'm feeling God. You can't put a limit. Simon, indefinitely, doesn't mean you got to say I look forward to it. doesn't mean you got to say, oh, I'm a glutton for punishment. It just means you got to let it go. It'll kill you. It'll destroy you. It'll make you bitter. It'll make your spouse bitter. It'll make your kids bitter. You'll complain about everything because of what something happened 25 years ago. My God, I feel God in here. And this man's very, as far as I know, this is the best church in the state because this couple's always complimentary. We talk about the Lord and eat good food and thank the Lord for our daily bread and look forward to what God's got in store. I'm talking to somebody. I'm talking to me.
This is where we live. I'd never preached this before, have I, honey? She said, oh, hallelujah, I get to hear a new sermon. And I've got them by the hundreds. And Jesus said, son, let it go. You're going to forsake me. <laughs> Look, God, you don't know me. Simon, I'm fast forwarding. For that old rooster crows three times. He didn't deny he even knew me. You're going to need some of that grace. Well, they're around the water cooler and they're saying some things that really isn't too healthy. You don't want to walk away because they'll call you holy rollers. When you stay, you don't want to laugh because it's inconsistent with your faith. And you're stuck. You're stuck in the world, but not of it, right? I feel God in here. Oh, come. Mokore peshita. Simon, you're going to deny me. The other ten, Judas will have denied me. They're going to deny me. I'm going to be betrayed by the ruler of the land, Pilate. They're going to pick Barabbas. I'm even going to cry on the cross. Father, why have you forsaken me? There's been times we've all felt forsaken. And we're going to feel it again. But in the midst of this prayer, Jesus comes back full circle. So like in your studies, there's a summary at the end of the book. What's the key points? What's the emphasis? All the rest of the Lord's Prayer. It's easy. Err. But the practical application is if we're going to make it, this is so simple. Let it go. Would you stand? He who the Son sets free is free indeed. How many times, Lord? As many as is necessary. I'm not advocating being a glutton for punishment. I'm not advocating being a doormat. I don't even know your life. I'm just saying don't let what someone else has done destroy you. You're too important. Don't let their mistakes bring you down. Be like the old donkey that was thrown in the pit. Because he was useless. And every day, they'd take the trash and throw it on the donkey and he would shake it off. And take one step higher. Next day, here comes the trash, throws it in the pit. Donkey, shake it off. And take one step higher. He had enough crumbs and the debris that he could maintain his health. After a few weeks, they threw just one more pile of trash in that pit. And the donkey shook it off. He stepped up. And he walked out of that pit. When someone throws trash your way, shake it off. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. Don't let man put you in chains. And I'm not talking about shackles that we experience in a prison. The prison most of us face is right here. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Lord Jesus, I've gone too long. Forgive me. I've shared my heart. It's for somebody. Paul said, Philippians 3.13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, concentration forgetting those things which are behind cancellation I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus continuation God help us to press on anyone in this room right where you are and I'm going to turn it over to your good pastor it's easy to implement and to live out the majority of the Lord's prayer but sometimes I have difficulty forgiving others, and I'm going to go one step further. I'm not going to camp out here. You need to forgive yourself. That was another point I'm not even going to dig into. Some pastors and I got together in Anderson a couple days ago to bless a man. Due to circumstances that was not his fault, he's hitting hard times, and he's blamed himself. 
He's not pastor now, but he's been a successful pastor. And I said, sir, we sat on the porch of that old Cracker Barrel on the corner of Clemson Boulevard in I-85. And I said, I'm going to tell you what you've told hundreds of people. Don't beat yourself down. It's not your fault. Let it go. If you have a need of any kind, would you lift your hand? Whatever the need is, would you lift your hands right now in Jesus' name? One step further. Never, never, ever get too hurry, too much of a hurry to invite people to come and pray. Those that raised your hand, others, if you want to come, or well, your good pastor closes with prayer. I'm just convinced that God is doing do, mm, that God is doing something special in this house. Maybe not just in the area that I ministered to in, but in other areas, God is doing something. We're not running aisles, we're not shouting, but God is moving. In Jesus' name. Will your good pastor comes? If anybody would like to come for special prayer or stay where you are in the pew for prayer, that's up to you. But God's working. Thank you, Pastor. Father, we thank you. There are many times that we get to a place that the words, I'm sorry, or please forgive me. is a resistor from our own lives. We've seen the pain that we've caused. We've seen the issues that we've caused. And there are moments that we do agree that it's our fault. But then there are moments that inflictions have come upon us by someone else and we've allowed it to steal our joy, our hope, our faith. But Lord, today as we take this message, And we apply it to our lives as you often apply the Word of God to us. May we be changed and different. And today, Lord, if there's one here that does not know you as Lord and Savior of their life, we pray that forgiveness, the ultimate forgiveness would come. And forgive them of their sins that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Bless us as we go our separate ways. Would you bring us back tonight, Lord, as we once again come and honor this day. That's the Lord's day. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Don't forget if you're free this week to come and help with VBS. And men, tomorrow night is our men's meeting. See you there.